Jeremiah chapter 29. I used to have this shirt, and on the shirt it, it, it said Bible. And then it broke it up into an acronym. Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth. I, I, I love that that shirt. I mean, I wore it till it had holes in it. One of my other shirts that I loved when I first got saved. Uh, the, my first shirt that I loved was where it said, Jesus is God. I mean, that just, I just, ooh, I get goosebumps thinking about it, how powerful our Savior is. But I love that one because it's so true. The Bible is basic instructions before leaving earth. We need to know what the Bible has to say. And unfortunately, we have too many people not reading their Bible anymore. We have a book that God has given to us, a letter in a sense, written to us, and yet we don't get into it. I remember uh, a friend of mine that um, I would go see pretty much two or three times a week, lived in the area, served here with us in the church, but he would struggle with reading his Bible. Intelligent guy, he could read, no problem at all. He, in fact, he would take the newspaper every morning and read the whole newspaper and Sunday's newspaper. And, and so I kind of challenged him. I says, you can do that, but you can't read your Bible. Why? It doesn't make any sense at all because you have that ability to, to read. I knew another guy who could not read. He had um, never learned to read. And I never knew it until he actually told me that he could not read because he would open up the scriptures to the numbers because he could tell what numbers were in chapters and so forth. And he would then quote to the scripture. And then later on down the road, I found out that he had a great memory. And so when he, you know, you compensate, you compensate. Uh, if you can't read, then you memorize and you're able to memorize things. And so he would quote scriptures verbatim and was really good at it. But he couldn't read his Bible. But he sure learned how to take the word of God and bring it into his heart. There's some that just can't read. And so it's so wonderful to know that God has given us the tools so that we can hear it. You know, on the radio, or we can hear it on a cassette. Well, okay, they don't make cassettes anymore. Uh, on MP3 or uh, iPod or iPhone. Well, iPhone, right? Or Galaxy or whatever other phone that you want to want to use there. He has given us all kinds of ways to hear and read and study the Word of God. And yet I'll guarantee you in this room, and I'm not trying to p point anyone out, I'll guarantee you that there are a lot of us here that don't even pick it up and read it. And that's sad because this is a letter from God to us. And we should be in His Word. Tonight's theme is God's letter. It's God's letter, and it's His letter to us. What does God's letter say to mankind? Well, we can start in Genesis and go all the way to Revelation. But basically, God's letter is a love letter, isn't it? It truly is. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Uh, that is the theme of the whole Bible. From the very beginning, that God created man to have a relationship with Him. And at the end, it will all be done and over, and every tear, er, every pain, every suffering will be wiped away, and that once again you'll be reunited to God, beginning to end. That, that's the whole letter in itself. Now, we have the center part of it, because the letter begins on how God loves us, but the meat of the letter is how we love Him. That's the meat of the letter. How do we love him back? By reading his word. By pleasing him. And the end of the letter is he's coming for us. He's coming for us. Now, we're going to see a letter here tonight given to Jeremiah to give to the Jews in Babylon. And this letter again is to encourage them to stay put. Stay where God has them. Don't try to get out of it. Just relax and be there and basically learn your lesson. Learn your lesson. How many of us are going through trials right now? I think that most of us will raise our hand. We're all going through a trial, a decision we're trying to make. And we're just struggling with that decision. What's your will, Lord? I love that one. What's your will, Lord? I don't know what your will is. And the Lord is so clear. I almost sound like Clinton right there. <laughs> It's like, it's so clear, and he keeps tapping you on the shoulder, and he tells you once, he tells you twice, but no, that's not enough, Lord, give me more. You, he already told you. Turn to James real quick. Let's remember this, because it, it, there is some application here for us today, and I'm going to give it to you right up front, because the Lord just laid this on my heart. Because sometimes we want to just get out of the situation. We don't like trials. We don't like struggles. Uh, we don't want to learn lessons. We just want to have a smooth ride. We just want to enjoy Disneyland, you know. I see so many posts on Facebook and 
Instagram, Disneyland. Yeah, some people are there almost every day, it seems like. You know, it's the amusement park where, where you go to get away and empty your mind. James chapter 1, verse 2. Uh, James says, my brethren. So these are believers. This letter is written to the dispersed church of the tr- different tribes there. It says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. So given an account, accounting, like an accountant, you take numbers and you have a ledger and you put that account number right on the, uh, on, on the ledger there and then you add them up or you minus them and this is the amount that you have. You have to keep track of those things. What he's saying here is that when you go through various trials, you have to keep track of them. Uh, maybe write a journal. But you need to remember what you've been through and what God has taught you through those trials. Because he says, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. This trial that you are going through is producing something in you, a fruit. And most of us don't want to see a fruit. We don't want to see the reason for the trial. We want to get out of the trial. We want the trial to be over. We want the trial to end, not in 70 years, but in two years, as we saw last week when this man said, oh, no, the trial will be over in two years. You'll be back in Jerusalem. We don't want it to last very long because we start crying. We start worrying. We stress out. Our lives are in, in, in shambles. Instead of sitting down and saying, Lord, let me count this trial as something wonderful. It's going to produce in me patience. This trial will produce patience in my life. Patience to wait on you. Patience to wait on people. Patience is a good thing. And it's a thing that I think all of us probably struggle with along with myself. Patience is a hard one for me. The only way that you can learn patience is under trials. It's the only way that you can. It's easy to be patient when everything's going right, but it's under trials when you really see if you have the patience that you think you have. And in reality, you don't. But he says, but let patience have its perfect work. So not only uh, do trials produce patience to your faith, but the patience has a perfect work. There's a perfect thing going on in your life that you may be perfect and complete, not lacking nothing, not lacking anything. And, And so you become a complete individual when you have patience. It encourages you to rest and trust in the Lord and that you are content wherever the Lord has you, as Paul said. I've learned to be content, whether I'm abounding or whether I am abasing. Wherever the Lord has me, I I know that he has me there and he has me there for a purpose and I need to wait upon the Lord until he tells me otherwise and learn my lesson. Now turn to Peter because Peter said the same thing. Chapter one. Oops. <clears throat> Verse six. <clears throat> he says, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. He's saying rejoice, and yet the trials grieve us. <laughs> we don't like trials. They just, they, and they're constant. They never stop because God is working that patience in us. And instead of grieving, we should be rejoicing that God would find us faithful to put us through a trial. That the genuineness of your faith, I love that, the genuineness of your faith, the only way that you can know if your faith is real, if your faith is, is strong enough if your faith is weighty in the sense that, that, that there's power there in your faith is by it going through various trials, various trials. I was just speaking to someone that uh, was entering into a trial and I said, your taste, your, your faith will be tested. And they looked at me like, what? I'm like, your faith is going to be tested right here. And it was, it was tested and he failed. He failed. So that shows him that he has some work to do in his relationship with Christ. <clears throat> so what does that mean that your faith is tested? God allows you to go through things to see how strong you really are in your faith. Yeah, I say, I believe in God, but then if a fiery trial comes, do you start running away? If all of a sudden a friend comes up to you and he begins to 
share with you some off jokes, that's a testing of your faith. Are, are you willing to stand there and say, well, I don't want to offend him. I don't want to make him feel like I'm holier than thou or, or I'm above him. And so I'll just kind of just stand here. But that's a test of your faith. Are you willing to just say, you know what? I, I don't need to hear those jokes. I don't want to hear those jokes. There's no reason for me to hear those jokes. It's, it's just dumb. It's just dumb. It doesn't make any sense at all. And go off. <laughs> I was reminded of a story this Monday night. <coughs> we had our uh, Raising Godly Children, uh, four, 14 to 18, the interesting years. And Virginia uh, re uh, brought this uh, story up about the boys <coughs> and their faith was tested and the only one that was able to prove their faith was Roman and this little test that God put them through they had gathered around some other boys that uh, were doing some pretty bad things like smoking and Roman from Virginia was saying was Roman after the fact told Virginia, what was going on? Roman stood up and said, I'm not doing this. I'm not going to follow you guys. That's just stupid. And he walked off, you know, just walked off. See, that's a testing of your faith and passing the test. <laughs> the other ones didn't pass, they failed because their faith wasn't strong enough to resist the enemy. That's the testing that we go through. But we want to get out of it, just like the children of Israel here. No, we want this trial, this bondage, this slavery that's supposed to last for 70 years. That's a long time. That's a lifetime, right? That's a lifetime, just like our trials are a lifetime. We want it to be over in two years so that we can go back to Jerusalem and enjoy the prosperity that God has promised to us. Peter goes on in verse 7 that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Boy, that will be the prize. That will be the crown when you stand before the Lord Jesus Christ himself and you'll be found praise and honor and glory before the Lord. We don't think like that, though, do we? We don't think of the future, and most people don't. They don't think of the future. You, you can tell by their finances. Uh, they're, they're, they're buying for right now and what they feel and what they need. And, 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 the, and the commercial system knows that. They, they put the produce, they put the candy bars, they put everything in a certain place because they know that it's going to entice you to buy it, even though you don't need it. And so they do that because they're trying to meet your need. Most people don't even have a budget. Statistically speaking, people live off of what they get and they just spend it as it comes along. They don't budget for things. They don't budget for their utility bills. They don't budget for their mortgage. They don't budget for their vehicles. They don't budget for, for their clothing. They don't budget for, you know, for entertainment. Those are all budget items. And we don't do that because we live for the now. We don't think of the future. We don't invest in the savings so that when we retire, we have something to retire on. We're, we're depending on our Social Security. Most of you are just thinking that. Just Social Security will get me by. It barely gets you by. You have to invest in some 401 or some sort of investment, some IRA or something like that. But we don't think like that. Not a lot of people think like that. Let's just spend it right now. And we think the same way spiritually. We don't think of the future and what God is going to do with the things we do while we're here on this earth. As Chuck used to always say, we only have one life to live and soon to pass. And what we do with Christ, those things will last. It's those things that we do with Christ that will last. So we can turn back to Jeremiah. Lord, lay that on my heart because the children of Israel are going through a bondage. They don't want to go through it. And there's these prophets these teachers that are arising and that are tickling their ears and telling them exactly what they want to hear. People want to hear the Joel Osteen message. You're going to be okay. Just get up. Trust God. He's going to bless you. Things will be right, you know. You're not going to go through trials. Then they won't be long because God is good. And that's what they want to hear, but they don't want to hear the truth that God has a work in our character. 
He wants us to be more like his son, Jesus Christ, who endured the, the ultimate trial on the cross, and he endured it out of love for us. And so we love him because he first loved us. <clears throat> and really, that's, that, that really is the key, is, is that we don't really love him as much as he loves us. And that's the truth, isn't it? It really is. And that's sad. Because we call ourselves Christians, which is Christ-like, but yet we're really not Christ-like at all. And that's all the word Christian means is Christ-like. There, there is no religious system called Christianity. There is no religious, there's no church called Christianity. We are the bride of Christ. We are the church. We're not Christianity. We're Christ-like that is Christianity, but we're to be Christ-like. We're to be like Christ. We're to live like Christ, act like Christ, respond like Christ. And so even under a heavy burden or a load, we find it joyful. And that's what Jesus said. I look to the cross and, it, and I know that it's going to bring a wonderful work. I, I love the passion of the Christ. It's not in Scripture, but I just love that saying because I know that, that it is true, that Jesus looked at the cross as something that was going to be gr a great thing to do. Uh, you remember the Passion of Christ? He fell that one time, and, and his mother came up and grabbed him, and he said to her, Mom, look, I'm making things new. And he was, like, excited about it, you know, in the movie, and you're, like, going, oh. I mean, he, he just didn't think about the suffering, didn't think about the thorns, didn't think about the, the nails in the hand. He just thought, Mom, I'm doing something new here. It's going to be great. That's what he thought about. That's what we need to think about. So this letter that uh, God gives to Jeremiah to give to the Jews that are in Babylon, we saw it last week a little bit where this one prophet stood up before Jeremiah, took the yoke off his head, broke it in half, and said, so will this uh, judgment of God's be broken within two years. And of course, we heard that God judged him within a year's time and his children. So now some time has passed and there are still some people that are struggling with this captivity. They're not willing to just stay. So this letter is written to them. Now these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent, to, sent from Jerusalem to the remainder of the elders who were carried away captive to the priest, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. So this letter is to the leadership of Jerusalem that were carried away into Babylon. Uh, some believe that, it, that this letter probably went to, to Daniel himself. And you can read about Daniel in the book of Daniel. Uh, a wonderful guy, such a, a beautiful leader. We don't know anything else about him but what Daniel tells us in the book of Daniel. Uh, there are a couple of references in the New Testament in Matthew 24 and Mark 13, but other than that, we get most of our information from Daniel. We know that he was from a royal line. He was a noble descent. And he was carried away into Babylon in the third year of Jehoiakim. He was trained under the king's service. And then he became, a, in a sense, a man that was able to interpret dreams. And that put him in a position where God could use him there with Nebuchadnezzar. And so this letter goes out to them. This happened after Jehoiakim. Kohen, the king, um, the king, the queen mother, the eunuch, the prince of Judah, again, Daniel uh, was included in that, and Jerusalem, the craftsmen and the smiths had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by the hand of Elsha, the son of Shephan, and Germerth, the son of Hilkiah, from Jedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon, to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, saying... So there apparently is still this conflict between Jeremiah and these religious leaders about the time frame of God's judgment. And so Jeremiah had written this letter to the exiles to encourage them uh, to give up any false hope of early return to Jerusalem. Just settle down. It's going to be 70 years and then God will bring you back to Jerusalem the fate of the people were to remain there under these conditions and to do the best that they could do in those places. And God was doing a work in their lives. He was removing their idolatry while they were there. He was teaching them patience in the Lord. I think I mentioned this a, a while ago. 
uh, one of the reasons that, that they were <coughs> taken into captivity was because of idolatry. They put things before God, idols before God. And one of the things that they had learned during this captivity is not to put things before God. And so from that point on, uh, they were very, very, very uh, conservative and strict on what they worshipped. They wanted to make sure they only worshipped God and that was it. And so they made all these rules. They learned their lesson and they went to worship God. But they began to worship tradition and they missed that. And so when you see them in the New Testament, these are men that had created all these traditions to try to worship God in the best way that they could, but they made it into a works thing and not a relationship. And that was the problem. Even at the, t at the end of Babylon, they created synagogues. That's where synagogues came in. They began to raise these little synagogues. You remember some of the people didn't want to leave Babylon after a while. They stayed there. Some of them went to Egypt. Uh, we know that there are synagogues in Egypt. And we know that there's Old Testament scriptures in Egypt, a lot of them. And they created these synagogues where they could worship the Lord. And so it, it was almost like God uh, in the Old Testament doing what he did in the New Testament with the book of Acts, where the word was not to just stay centralized there in Jerusalem. It was supposed to get out. It was supposed to go everywhere. And God was just planting seeds all over the place. And so they had a work to do. And the Lord would, would, would punish the, these men that were telling them uh, to rebel in a sense. He goes on. And gives us the context of this letter, verse 4. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all who were carried away captive, whom I have cursed to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and dwell in them. Plant gardens and eat their fruit. Take wives, beget sons and daughters. Take wives, your sons, and give your daughters to husbands so that they may bear sons and daughters, that you may be increased there and not diminish. So Jeremiah was saying, basically, instead of hoping to return back to Judah, settle down, build yourself some houses, plant a garden, take wives, have children, have your children have children so that you can have grandchildren and just wait upon me. And in, in a sense, for us today, you know, we live in the world, but we're not to be a part of the world. That is probably the biggest struggle of the church today is that we live in the world, but Paul said we're not to be a part of the world. What do you mean by that? Romans 12, 1 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Christ offered up his body for all of us. Our reasonable service is to offer up our bodies to God. These are bodies are His, and we are to give Him these bodies to be used as vessels for His glory, for His service. He goes on and says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. If you don't know the perfect will of God, it's because you're still in the world. He's saying, Get out of the world here. Don't be conformed to the world. Don't let the world conform you. I like the way the living translation says it. Don't copy the behavior and customs of the world. That's pretty clear. That is pretty clear. So it's St. Patrick's. Let's go have a St. Patrick's drink. And let's wear green and let's wear all kinds of funny hats you know and let's go to bars and drink green beer and green drinks and you know all of, that's the world that is the world saint patrick was a believer why don't we worship his god instead of him god doesn't want his glory to be given to anyone and i'm sure if saint patrick were here today he'd say what are you guys doing <laughs> you have my day it should be Christ's day no don't copy the behavior. of We shouldn't be doing that stuff. We shouldn't be doing that stuff. Again, back to jokes. The world will tell you all kinds of off-the-wall off jokes, and they'll laugh and how hilarious. And they'll, de they'll demeanor women. They'll demeanor a certain nationality, and we're ha, 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 ha. And then we begin to participate in that. We start laughing and so forth. Do not copy the behavior and customs of this world. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. That's what the Living Translation says. Then you will learn 
to know the will of God for you, which is good and pleasing. Let God transform you into a new person. But we want the world more than we want to be a new person. But you must be born again, the Bible says. The old things pass away. Behold, all things are new, the Bible says. And the fruit has to be spiritual, not worldly fruit. Philippians 2.15 says that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Are you a light? Or are you just join, joining the darkness? How do you know if you're a light in the world, when the world hates you, when the world says, hey, that's a little too much. Come on, you're being a little too Christian here. You're too uh, radical for me, you know. You're in church. My brother used to say, so you're, you're in church all the time. That's weird. That's strange. You're there Sunday. You're there Wednesday. You're there on Fridays. You know, you go to men's breakfasts and you go to conferences on weekends and you spend your vacations. You're just really weird. See, that's when you know you're light, because darkness doesn't like it. And we live in a perverse and crooked generation. And we ought to be the light that's there, that's shining in. That's the only way that the world is going to know the truth, unless we shine. But we're in an interesting situation. And I really do believe that it's because we are living in the last days. That even the elect could be deceived. And I think we're seeing that, that a lot of Christians who... Uh, Someone was just saying it tonight at prayer. Uh, someone that calls themselves Christians, but then when you listen to them, you <laughs> they're not a Christian. The way they talk, things they say about others, the way they live in their lives, it's a big question mark. Now, I'm not to judge whether someone's heart is right with the Lord or not. I don't know, but the fruit is not there. They're not shining like a light. Jeremiah is saying, look, you're there for 70 years. You might as well be a light. Buy your houses, have wives, raise up children, start a synagogue, be a light. Let your whole family be a light there in your community. That's the way it should be for us today. He goes on in verse 7, Seek the peace of the city, for I have caused you to be carried away captive, and pray to the Lord for it, for in its peace you will have peace. Now he's talking a little political stuff there, right? You know, go to the city, make friends with the mayor. Get to know them, share the gospel, and you'll have peace. And you might even bring peace, even more peace to that city. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners or, or who are in your midst deceive you, nor listen to your dreams which you cause to be dreamed, for they prophesy falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them, says the Lord." The time was set. Look at verse 10. For thus says the Lord, after 70 years are complete at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you and cause you to return to this place. After 70 years, I'll fulfill what I've said I was going to do. Just like with us, at the end when we stand before Christ, then he will honor and give praise for the things that we've done. And that's coming. And maybe sooner for some of us than others. Daniel understood this clearly. In Daniel 9, 2, this letter was sent to him. And this is what Daniel said. I, Daniel, understood by the books, the numbers of the year specified by the Lord of the Lord, of the Lord, the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. Then I set my face towards the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplication with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. What was he praying for? that he would survive through the 70 years, that they'd be an example. And he's acknowledging Daniel's letter there. Through the prophet Daniel, acknowledge that 70 years have to come by. The Bible just ties everything in together. It's just wonderful. And then we, we have this beautiful saying that we all know in Jeremiah 29, 11, right? We all use it for, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope beautiful words but these words are given to him in a time when they're in captivity to bring them hope and so god would say that to us too i know the thoughts that i think towards you yeah you're going through a trial yeah your relationships are in shambles but i know the thoughts that i have for you i know you're confused 
I know you don't know what direction to go, but I know the thoughts that I have towards you. And these thoughts are of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. I understand this as a parent, and those of you that have children should understand this too as a parent. Your kids, <laughs> they're your kids. You love them to death. You love them to death. If I had a time machine, I'd probably go back to the day that uh, my children were probably in that second f group of kids that we taught about, the 6 to 10. I, I just love that, that age. And I miss it so much. My boys weren't the best. They got into all kinds of trouble. But you know what? I loved them. And, and my thoughts were never of hatred were never of your bad, you're just bad, bad kids. They were always with an intent that they had a future in this world and that I was going to help them as much as I could. And we still have that philosophy. We go, I, I believe, we go beyond what grandparents usually do <laughs> because we love our kids and their kids. Though they're headaches at times, and they disagree, and they want to go their own way and stray, but you don't give up because you're a parent and because you love them. Oh, you might get mad and upset and might not like it, but you have thoughts of peace and not of evil, but of a future and a hope, even in the midst of struggles within your family within your family. Someone pointed out to us that, um, and I, I kind of knew it, but just to hear it from someone else, that this church is about, when you think of this church, our church here in Mariloma, one of the things that you think about when you really think about it, and I presented this question to others, what is the first thing that comes to mind when you think about this church? And one of the first things that a lot of people say is family. It's family. Probably because they see me, my wife, and my boy serving here that's family. And then they see others who come along and become a part of our family, like, like Randy is a part of our family. <clears throat> and then others a part of our family. And then families coming here and being families here. And so this church is about families. And families stick together. Families go all the way to the end. That's what family is all about, no matter what is going on. And so what God is saying is, look, I know where you're at. And you're there for 70 years, but I know my thoughts towards you. I got your back. I've got a future for you. So you can hope. You can rest assured. I haven't forgotten about you. I'm working to work. And you'll be surprised when it happens. And that's God. And that's what he's doing in our lives. And we have to understand that. So he says in verse 12, Then when you call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. God would never deny a person that is so adamant and persistent in seeking the Lord. He will answer you. That means that you're on your face for an hour or two saying, God, do something here. Please, I'm begging you. It, it's not to say, Lord, can you help me? And then go off and do your thing. No, that's not prayer. That's not seeking the Lord. This word seeking there is a continual action. It, it, it is you are constantly seeking God's face. Kind of like you're in the ocean and you're trying to find something. You just keep Swimming until you can see it. Oh, I see it. I can see a shadow. Oh, I got to get there. You know, and just keep on going. And then you get a little closer, like, oh, there it is. And you just keep on going. And it's like every time you get closer, it seems to get away. And then all of a sudden, you finally see it a little bit. And you go, oh, look at that. That fish is so beautiful. And I've been swimming for an hour here trying to just take a look at that fish. And you finally saw it. And God said, if you seek me, you will find me. And that's exactly what Daniel did. We saw that in three. I will set my face towards the Lord God. 
to make requests by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. That was their custom. They would fast. They would take their clothes off and put uncomfortable clothes on. And then they would put ashes on themselves to remind them of humility and coming before God and, and really saying, God, I really need an answer here. And I, I, I'm just, you know, taking every effort that I can think of to seek your face and to find you. And verse 14 says, I will find you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from your captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I've driven you, says the Lord. And I will bring you to the place from which I cause you to be carried away captive. Then he says to those who were left there in Judah, who didn't go into captivity, he says, because you have said the Lord has raised up prophets for us in Babylon. Therefore, thus says the Lord, concerning the king who sits on the throne of David, concerning all the people who dwell in the city, and concerning your brethren who have not gone out with you into captivity. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will send on them the sword, famine, pestilence, and will make them like rotten figs that cannot be eaten. They are so bad. And I will pursue them with the sword, with famine, with pestilence, and I will deliver them to the trouble among all the kingdoms of the earth to be a curse, an astonishment, a hissing, and a reproach among all the nations where I have driven them. Because they have not heeded my words, says the Lord, which I sent to them by my servant the prophets, rising up early and sending them. Neither would you heed, says the Lord God. These were the people that stayed in Judah didn't go into captivity. These were the people who were, were saying, look, our prophets are saying, this is going to be a short term. This isn't going to last very long. And, and so we can depend on them. We can trust in them. And they were raising these men up. And God was saying, no. And because you're being rebellious, I'm going to send the sword and I'm going to wipe you out. What you need to do is you need to listen to, to your leadership. You need to listen to the prophets that I have sent you. I've sent them to you with the truth and it's your responsibility <clears throat> to heed them. Therefore, hear the word of the Lord, all you of the captivity whom I have sent from Jerusalem to Babylon. Now, <clears throat> the false prophets uh, will be judged because of what they have done by misleading the people. So thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel concerning Ahab, the son of Kolach and the son of Mashiach who prophesy a lie to you in my name. Behold, I will deliver them into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he shall slay them before your eyes. Now, make a note here, though, because you probably read those words. And, oh, those are the kings, right? Ahab, they're not kings. These are the false prophets. They just have the same names. Different uh, fathers, though, because they're different sons, uh, sons of different men. So these are not kings. These are the false prophets. So make a note in your Bible there. These are false prophets here. There are two of them. We don't know anything about them, but what is mentioned here. And because of them, a curse shall be taken up by all the captivity of Judah who are in Babylon, saying, The Lord make you like Zedekiah and Ahab, whom the king of Babylon roasted in the fire. So, so what Jeremiah was doing basically here is he's saying, look, um, there's a curse coming on you. And so this is the curse, that the Lord will make you like Zedekiah and Ahab, whom the king of Babylon roasted in a fire. That's about as bad as they can get in cursing someone. It's interesting, uh, I learned this a while ago, but in the Hebrew language, there are no curse words, which is interesting makes sense because with God why would he create a curse word that's not who he is and so in Hebrew there are no curse words so the worst they can do is is they can reference a bad situation in someone's life and say may you be cursed like that situation there and God's going to do that to you now it doesn't mean that Jews don't curse because they can use our language <laughs> and curse very well or someone else's language and curse just fine because in the English language there's a lot of curse words. In the Spanish language, oh, there are curse words that I probably have said don't even know it's a curse word. Um, you know, so interesting uh, 
how God created the language without curse words. I, I, li- I love that because it just speaks so much about who God is and his character. So the Lord make you like Zedekiah and Ahab, whom the king of Babylon roasted in a fire. That's how it's going to be with you. So because they have done disgraceful things in Israel, have committed adultery, do not be conformed like the world. Don't be doing the things of the world. Adultery. Adultery. That's happening a lot more than ever before. Adultery. I just heard a situation. A friend was telling me about a couple where uh, the wife was caught in adultery. And the people were consoling the husband. And then it turns out that the husband, while he was on mission trips, was having adultery over there. And it was just like all messed up. It's like whew, ministry was out of the question for them. It happens more than, than we think. These prophets, they were having adultery with their neighbors, wives. And then they've spoken lies, words in my name, which I have not commanded them. Those are lies. The Joel Osteens, uh, the Paul Crouch, the Cirillo Dollar who's asking for money to buy a new jet right now because the old jet just isn't good enough anymore. So he's asking for 200,000 people to donate $300. This will be like several million dollars for a jet who preaches a gospel of prosperity, which is a, a lie. There's no gospel of prosperity. The gospel is the good news that Jesus died on the cross. <laughs> Not that God came to make you prosper or wealthy or healthy or that you can claim it because you blab it and then you grab it, you know? That's not what God came to do. He brought trials and tribulations. I mean, there was one point where they were saying, if you're sick, it's because you have no faith in God. That's scary. That is scary when they are telling you this lie. Or the Joel Osteen, you know, that God's going to prosper you. It doesn't matter what you believe in. Or these pastors who are saying, God loves the homosexual, and he does, and so he's fine with same-sex marriage. It's okay. Just recently, another another pastor of a church says, that's it, we're, we're allowing same-sex marriage to be a part of the church. They can be in leadership. They can serve the Lord because the Lord loves them. They love one another. As long as they're married to one another, just like, uh, 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 like God had prescribed in Genesis, and then we're okay with that. That's lies. That's lies. What's awaiting them? That's a scary place to be. We were talking at the, a meeting yesterday <clears throat> with uh, Justin Alfred, and we're looking at the Greek of, of words. This is a class where I'm taking Greek and Hebrew, and, and they're presenting uh, messages, iron sharpens iron. And it is just amazing when you look at the, at the Greek, how much more clear the text is. It's totally amazing. And, and I just kind of mentioned, I said, that's scary. Because here we are presenting the word and how many times have we presented it with some air because of the Greek, the intent or the mood or even the voice of how they're saying it. For instance, like John the Baptist, we saw how he said, I am not worthy to untie the sandals. Do you remember that Sunday? I'm not worthy to untie the sandals. of Jesus. That word I in the voice is emphatic. What John was saying was, and he was like saying, I am not worthy to even be a slave to untie his shoe. With all that emotion. I am nobody. I'm not even a slave. I am worse than that, that I can't even carry his shoe as slaves do. That's amazing when you think about it because that just puts everything into perspective, doesn't it? We are nothing compared to Jesus, and yet he loves us. So when I mentioned, what, a couple of weeks ago, how we're cockroaches, you know, it's, it's probably worse than that if you really think about it. But isn't God amazing? that he would send his son for us, his creation, because he loves us that much. It's lying. That's a scary place to be right here and teach God's word and have air. I have prayers that, that I pray to God and asking for forgiveness if I've misled someone or have said something in air. I pray that because I'm not a theologian and I'm not a Greek or Hebrew scholar. You know, and so I want that to be covered. Lord, I'm not doing intentionally, 
It may happen, though, because of my education or, or, or my stupidity, Lord. And so forgive me. Forgive me for that, Lord. I don't stand up here arrogantly saying this is it, you know. But it's clear as we read through it. And that's why I love Chuck's heart when he started Calvary Chapel and then started the radio program. He said, I, I just want to raise up guys that just go through the word because it's simple. Just go through the word. Don't try to make up things. Don't try to be all educated and theological. Just simply go through the word. And you listen to him, and he's just going through the word, repeating it, expounding on a little bit, and moving on. And it's just amazing. And God's faithfulness to him because he just stuck with the word. Now, there are times where you can read his commentaries in the Old Testament. He'll go through five to ten chapters. And most of it's just reading the word, and you're just sort of going, because the Spirit is just moving from the Word of God, nothing else. And he'll make a comment here and there, and you're just going, wow, this is awesome, because the Spirit gets fed. These guys aren't um, telling the truth, though. They're lying, which I have not commanded them. Indeed, I know, and I am witness, says the Lord. So these two guys are disgraceful, adulterers, and liars. So Jeremiah writes this letter, gets to Babylon, starts spreading around, and so Shimei finds out, and so he writes his own letter, verse 24. You shall also speak to Shimei the Nehelamite, saying, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, You have sent letters in your name to all the people who are in, at Jerusalem, to Zephaniah, the son of Manasai, the priests, and to all the priests, saying, The Lord has made you priests instead of Jeconiah, the priest, so that there should be officers in the house of the Lord over every man who is demented or considered himself a prophet, that you should put him in prison and in the stocks. Now, therefore, why have you not rebuked Jeremiah of Athioth, who makes himself a prophet for you? For he has sent to us in Babylon, saying, The captivity is long. Build houses and dwell in them and plant gardens and eat their fruit. Now Zephaniah the priest read this letter in the hearing of Jeremiah the prophet. So this guy just it writes right back. Why are you listening to Jeremiah? You got to take him and his prophets and just cast them into jail right now. And that's what they're trying to do to the pastors that are teaching the word of God today. They're trying to find ways that get us in the jail. Take away our rights. It's already happening in Canada. You can't teach from behind the pulpit and use the word homosexuality in a negative way. You just can't do that. There's a law that says that we can't speak about political things more than a certain percent of your message. Otherwise, you can be threatened to have your nonprofit be taken away. And so <laughs> what the church has done, the pastors that, that uh, are strong enough have all decided to get together and once a year, they pick a day and they just talk politically the whole time. And they record it and then they send it to the IRS and to Washington and say, here you go, go ahead, come and get us. Just to say, we're going to do it no matter what because we don't serve you, we serve God. And we're going to preach the word of God as it is applied to our society. And we'll become prophets like Jeremiah to this world if that's what needs to be. Because we are living in those type of ages. And the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, Jeremiah said me, saying, send to all those in captivity, saying, thus says the Lord concerning Shimei, the Nehemite, because he has prophesied to you and I have not sent him and he has caused you to trust in a lie. Therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, I will punish him and his family. He shall not have anyone to dwell among his people, nor shall he see the good that I will do for my people, says the Lord, because he has taught rebellion against the Lord. It is rebellious to go against the word of the Lord. And it will hurt us if we go against the word of the Lord. As Christians, when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, 
we have made a decision to accept what his word says and have applied it to our lives, even if we disagree with it. We have, we should have naturally the spirit of God that gives us a hunger for his word and a desire to be obedient to that word. And if we don't have that, then there's something wrong with our decision making. There's something wrong with our walk with him. And there's even something wrong as whether the Spirit's there or not, or whether you've quenched it so much that He's not moving in your life. But as a believer, it is rebellion to go against the Word of the Lord. Let me close. And I want to leave you with this because it is true. God said, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. That's His heart. but he won't force it on you. You have to decide to seek him with all your heart. And when you do, he'll bless you. But if you don't, it's just like hell. He doesn't send us to hell. It's our choice. We reject him and we send ourselves to hell. But if we receive him, we have eternal life. It's all there. It's a wonderful thing. It's like having a bank account with a billion dollars in it. And it's available to us but we never use it. We never go to it. And we end up dying without it because we never sought it. God has everything for us and all we have to do is seek Him because He wants to bless us in this life. And I'm not talking about money and, and wealth and that material things. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a blessed life. Family, children, grandchildren, church, serving one another, being a part of a community. Um, that's what I'm talking about. It's, it's a blessing. It's a blessing. I was here on, on Monday. Bonnie was here. And I was out there bringing the trash cans in. And the girls, this girl's walking by and um, rolling the trash can. She looks up at me and she goes, hi. So I said, oh, hi. How are you doing? And she's walking off. And so I'm rolling the trash can and she stops. And I see her stop. So I stopped and she says, you have a cigarette? And I'm like, no, I don't, I don't smoke. She goes, oh, you have a lighter? I'm like, well, if I don't smoke, why would I have a lighter? <laughs> and why would you need a lighter if you need a cigarette? <laughs> so I'm just kind of, this is going through my head. I go, no, don't have a, a lighter. She goes, oh. And then she looks at me and she says, are you okay? <laughs> I'm looking, and I'm like, yeah, are you sure? I'm, now I'm getting concerned, like, do I look white? I mean, am I, you know, kind of blushing or what? And she goes, no, something's wrong with you, though. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> and so, you know, it just kind of threw me off, and I, I said, you know, I'm the pastor here uh, of this church. She goes, you're a what? <laughs> pa the pastor here, she's like, really? <laughs> I go, Yeah. So she, she says to me, you got food? <laughs> and so at this point, I'm like, do I hate her or do I love her? <laughs> you know? And so I go, yeah, we have food. You need food? She goes, yeah, I need some food. So I take her back here to, to get her food. And I'm you know, just talking with her. I said, what's your name? She goes, Mercy. I'm like, oh, wow. I go, what a beautiful name. I'm like, oh, it just reminds me of God's mercy for us. And so I was sharing with her a little bit. And so we're in the room, and she sits down, and she's just looking at the food, and I'm looking at her, and all of a sudden, I thought, are you okay? <laughs> she goes, yeah. I go, okay, because it looks like you're on drugs. She goes, oh, I wish I had some right now. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, you're new to the neighborhood, right? And she goes, yeah, I just live in that. Yeah, I thought so, because I know most of the people around here, and they come by, and they wave at me. And some of them wave, and I don't even know them, and they know me, you know, and so forth. And, but you're new here. Yeah, I'm 22. I just moved over there and things are going on, blah, blah, blah. And <clears throat> so I prayed with her, gave her food and tried to encourage her to come here. And I'm just like, it's just a blessing. But yet, do you hate them or do you love them? You know? And then I, I was telling Virginia, I, I leave and she's on, sitting on the uh, wood out there on the outside of the gate eating her food. You know? and, and I come back in the afternoon and I find all the food all over the floor. <laughs> And the things she didn't want just thrown all over. And I'm like, Lord, 
Do I hate her? Do I love her? He's like, you love her. You love her. That's a blessing. To me, that's a blessing to be able to even minister to someone like that that obviously doesn't want to be ministered to, that obviously doesn't care what you think about, obviously doesn't care (laughs) about messing up your place at all, has no conscience about it at all, is totally self-absorbed, and yet you get to plant a seed and, and water it. That's a blessing to me. That brings joy to my heart. Because it tells me that I have God in me, right? Only God could do that, not me. The old guy would have said, forget you. I'm going to go get my own drugs. <laughs> you know? And it's a blessing to know God. And that he has a thoughts of peace, not of evil, but a future and a hope. And that's what he wants for all of us, if we're willing to seek him.